Welcome. I'm Becky. My dear friend Carol Klingbeil and I teamed up and interviewed some authors, musicians, and artists. And we wanted to explore how beauty shapes their lives. Now, I had the great privilege of meeting Greg Braden on a guided trip in Peru. He is what I consider a Renaissance man. He is a five-time New York Times bestselling author, lecturer, researcher, educator, and he's internationally renowned as a pioneer bridging modern science with ancient wisdom and human potential. I'm so excited to bring this interview to you. I know you're going to find this as fascinating as I did. We'll start here, Greg uh, and um, and Becky. Take one. <laughs> okay, so I'm all yours. You can you can you can you can start. You can do introduction wherever you want to do right now. Well, I actually read your bio ahead of time so that we would have a little more time with you. You gathered us in a circle on top of Machu Picchu right after sunrise. And um, before you spoke, I, I was, you know, putting my things where I wanted them. And, um, and I really wanted to approach you on the subject of beauty. I remember thinking about doing a documentary at the time. Beauty was one of your guiding principles. Right. And as soon as you said that, I thought, wow, beauty is actually one of my guiding principles, but I never thought to claim it as a guiding principle. You know, everything from the woods that I lived in, that I grew up near and, um, and nature and to the way I decorate my home, to the way I appreciate art, everything mm. really is a guide, you know, beauty is definitely on a top value of mine. But until you said that it was a guiding principle of yours, I didn't think of beauty that way. And you also um, gave us uh, the, Navajo prayer that is all about beauty. So I would love for you to tell us about your your perspective on beauty and um, and share with us the prayer. Wow. Well, you just covered a lot of ground in uh, in those statements. So I'm I'm going to begin first just by saying thank you for creating this very important summit. Uh, I think it is important. I'm honored to share this virtual stage with some dear friends and colleagues. So thank you for keeping me in mind when when you put this together. Uh, and Becky, I remember you, because uh, you did travel with me and, and I remember very well. I remember I've got a good memory. I remember that day. Uh, I remember all my days in, in Peru. And it was an especially beautiful morning uh, because we were we were allowed to go into Machu Picchu a little earlier than uh, than the thousands of people that would follow later in the day. And it wasn't precisely sunrise, but it was very near sunrise. And. Uh, and we were there in, intentionally, <clears throat> and I didn't know what I was going to talk about that day. I don't have it planned uh, until I'm walking up into, into the place where we gather. And it's the, the movement, the physical movement to me is a meditation. And it was during that meditation that the, the power of beauty became so apparent to me that that is what our morning would be about. So you asked me uh, two things. I'll say on a personal level. Before I knew any of the indigenous traditions, I knew that beauty meant something different to me than it did to a lot of my friends and, and people. I grew up in uh, northern Missouri, a, a rural community, conservative values in, in northern Missouri. And people appreciated beauty, but it was an aesthetic for them. And it was for me, but it was always more. There was this emotional component, something so powerful. Uh, and I invited it to become a cornerstone in my life without fully understanding what it meant. So, for example, I, I worked, uh, I'm a scientist, I'm a degreed earth scientist, a strong background in, in the life sciences, math, physics, uh, computer science, cosmology. And, and, uh, and I worked as a scientist in the, in the industry during the 1970s and the 80s. And I made a choice in 1990. At the end of the Cold War, I was uh, working in the defense industry. Uh, and when the Cold War ended, my time in that industry ended. And I said, you know, I could find another job in another big city where everything is convenient and at my fingertips, which I have done now for most of my adult life at that time in my life, 
or I could find a place where I wake up every morning surrounded by beauty. And I said, you know, I've already done the city thing and beauty won out. And I actually, uh, I sought out and found one of the most isolated, remote, beautiful, mystical, pristine pieces of property I could find in the high deserts of Northern New Mexico. Uh, and I moved there thinking I would never travel again. And it, the irony is that it was <clears throat> on that land, which is surrounded by indigenous land. It is the, the Taos, the Tiwa people are there uh, to my south and the Ute tribes are to the north in Colorado where you used to live. And uh, of course the, the Zuni and the Navajo and the Apache uh, and the Hopi uh, as we go out to the west. And it was when I, I had the opportunity to meet a Hopi uh, elder and at the same time a Navajo elder. And the Navajo elder said to me uh, in one of our conversations, where I'll just tell you the story. We met in an archeological site, this, uh, this Chaco Canyon in the Northwestern corner of I've New been Mexico. there. I love yeah. Chaco Canyon. It's one of the most mysterious places. It's a, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site now. Uh, as well as a national park, something happened in Chaco that never happened anywhere else on the face of the earth. And it's so mysterious, it cannot be explained. They don't know with certainty who built it or why, because it appeared suddenly, highly sophisticated architecture. Uh, they had mathematics, they had astronomy, they knew about constellations and uh, cosmic events that, that were unknown at that time, and then they disappeared. And all we have is the legacy and the mystery and no written records in terms of a language. And it was in this place uh, where I lead groups that I met a Navajo elder. And we began talking about the power of beauty. And what he said to me was so profound, Becky, and I think this is the second part of your, of your question. He said, in their traditions, they, of course, acknowledge modern science. And science tells us, physics tells us there are four forces of nature. Uh, the four fundamental forces that physics is trying to unify as a unified field theory. There's the electromagnetic field, uh, gravity, and the strong and the weak nuclear fields. But he said, you know, our people, the native people have always told us there's a fifth force that's not accounted for in science. And I said, what is that force? He said, it is the force of beauty. And I said, well, is, is beauty an aesthetic that we experience in our lives, or is it a force, literally a force in the universe? He said, yes. And that was my answer. It is both. And I began to understand as the science revealed itself through the years, that when we are in the presence of beauty, we, we are changed in the presence of beauty. And the indigenous peoples of the world that I have spent time with for bulk of my adult life, I have experienced indigenous traditions all over the world from the highlands of central China and Tibet and Nepal and India and certainly all through the American desert southwest and the Yucatan and Mexico and the Andes mountains of, of Peru and into Bolivia and the aboriginals and you know the Bedouins and Egypt I mean it goes on and on is different as they are from one another they all have this sense uh, of the power of beauty. And here's, here's where they are so very different from us. They do not separate art from science from everyday life in those traditions, which makes a lot of sense because when we are in the presence of what we perceive as beauty, so it could be a sculpture, it could be art, could be music, Absolutely. Could, could be a book, it could be in nature, it could be a mountain, a forest, a tree, uh, an eclipse, a full moon, whatever that beauty is, we are changed because we have a feeling about what we are seeing. And what science now tells us is when we have that feeling, that is a chemical shift happening within our bodies. And the chemistry is so powerful, it can actually upregulate or downregulate genes that influence things like the immune response and longevity enzymes. Just from being in the power of beauty. I say just because to us, it, it, it seems so simple, but it's so eloquent. And you know, when, when we begin to understand the simple elegance as well as sophistication of the human body, I'm not surprised that it would be that simple because life is simple, nature is simple until we make it complex with language, with uh, you know, mathematics or symbols. 
And the beauty is that we don't have to know all the science to benefit from the power of beauty. But now that we're, we're talking about this, so the Navajo have, have allowed this to be a cornerstone in their tradition. And what you're refer referring to, Becky, is we experience together a prayer that is called the Navajo Beauty Prayer. It's actually a very lengthy prayer in the full ceremony. They have an abbreviated uh, form that I shared in Machu Picchu that, that day, and I'll share with our, our viewers today. And I, I recite this to myself so many times a day. I don't, I, I don't even know how many times because it is a cornerstone in my life. And the prayer simply says, the beauty that I live with, the beauty that I live by, the beauty upon which I base my life. What those mean, the beauty that I live with, this is so powerful because it tells us the beauty already exists. Our job, our role is to seek out beauty in all things because it exists from the lightest of the light to the darkest of the dark, to, to the greatest ecstasy, to the deepest levels of suffering. There is always beauty somewhere in those things. And our job is to find it. Mother Teresa was a master at, at doing these things. The beauty that I live with, the beauty that I live by invites us <clears throat> to allow that beauty to play a role in our lives and to become, uh, to become a, a foundation, a cornerstone of the way that we make our choices. And that leads to the third portion, the beauty upon which I base my life, to allow beauty to become this, this pivotal, bring it front and center instead of having it on the back burner and allow beauty to become this value, this principle as well as a force of physics in our lives. And when we do that, we are changed in the presence of beauty. So, uh, so for me, beauty played a role in my life before I knew why. And I simply honored my intuitive sense that it was important for me and healthy. It's healthy for me to be surrounded by beauty. And as the science became more, uh, more apparent, and actually some of it is just new. Some of the science is so new that we're only beginning to understand it. What I found is beauty is a necessity and that we're wired. Humans are wired to bring beauty in their lives in a way that no other form of life that we know of uh, can do consciously, at will, on demand. We're the only form of life that can say in this, in this moment, I choose to create beauty or I choose to recognize the beauty that surrounds me and invite that beauty into my life. And that is a very, very powerful, powerful form of, of mastery. So it's a long answer to a short question, but you asked too, and I wanted to lay that foundation and then we can tie into that for uh, wherever right. you'd like to go. Well, I love that. And for me, it is a priority and, and it shows how it should be a priority for everybody if it influences our body and if it influences our life in a very significant way. And, um, you know, um, for me, no, can, the, the gratitude, when I feel really appreciative of something that's when I know I'm in the presence of beauty whether like you said if it's music or art but beauty is definitely still in the eye of the beholder you know not everybody thinks that you know a tree is beautiful even though you know that's you know something I think or nature a lot of people don't even um, resonate with nature the way I do but um, it's important I think to examine what is beauty in your mm. life Mm -hmm. I agree, Becky. It's, it is, it's a very old adage that beauty is in the eye of the beholder because we, this, I mean, this goes so deep. We, our experiences in the womb before we ever emerge into this world, and from the moment we take our first breath in this world, our experiences become the template through and the lens through which we perceive our world. And the quality and the nature of those templates determine what we appreciate is beauty and what we fear, what we loathe, what we are drawn to. And because we have such different and varied and unique and diverse experiences, of course, we will all perceive uh, you know, things as uh, beauty in, in different ways. 
you know, some of the experiments that are just fascinating to me have shown, for example, you and I, the three of us right now, we could be in the same room and we could be looking at a blue screen projected from a, a computer projector. And although it's probably true that we would each see the blue screen, the blue that we would see would be different for each one of us. We would perceive hmm. a different tone, a different vibrance, a different texture, different quality of blue, even though we're looking at the same thing. And this is why we go through life. And I can be walking with a friend in the forest. And I said, my God, can you feel that? This, I mean, just, this is such a beautiful place. And my friend will say, oh yeah, it's pretty cool. What do you want to do for lunch? You know, <laughs> and, and it, it, mean, it, it means different things. So you're, you're, this is where you're right on. Part of our job is to honor ourselves by recognizing what is beautiful to us and, uh, and why we find beauty where we do. And my experience is, as I begin to do that, my, my sense of beauty expands and I find beauty in more and more places and more and more things. Our job, I, you know, I was beating around the bush a little bit. Mother Teresa was such a beautiful example of this with the Sisters of Charity in uh, Calcutta. They would wake up before the sun would rise and they'd go into the streets, into the places where people don't go, uh, typically, where, you know, tourists and, and things like that. And they would find the humans that had been cast out by their families as, as what are called untouchables. And these are the people that are diseased. Uh, the families don't want them. They leave them in, in the, the streets to die. And the Sisters of Charity would go out and find these people and bring them back and bathe them and put them in white gowns so that the last sometimes moments or possibly hours of their lives would be in dignity. And it was a very, very difficult, mm -hmm. uh, difficult job on one level. And Mother Teresa, in the filth and the stench and the, the, the garbage in the gutters of the streets where these bodies would be found, they would find uh, a daisy growing up out of the cow dung. And in that daisy, Mother Teresa would say, there is beauty in the streets. And there was beauty in the life of the people that they were bringing back to give the dignity of, of death, if that was their fate, or uh, possibly a healing. So she found beauty in places where people typically would see only ugliness and, and horrible things. And, and to me, if she can do that, it means that I can do it anywhere. And I think it's, it's a beautiful example. It's just one example of the, the power of beauty in our lives. Now, now the science is moving so quickly. Uh, medical doctor, his name is doctor, he's a, a, a neuroscientist, uh, Dr. Andrew Newberg tells us that the power of a single thought is enough to change a gene in our DNA, to upregulate a gene or downregulate a gene in our DNA and influence our immune system. When we perceive beauty, we're having a thought as well as an emotion about that. So this is why it, it begins, it, it never made sense to me to separate beauty from everyday life. How, where do you draw the line between everyday thinking and living and your experience of beauty? And, and the people that, that find the place to draw that line, those are the people that live in the, in the isolation and they experience a suffering uh, because of the compartmentalization, uh, in my experience, the compartmentalization of their lives. And when we allow beauty to permeate our lives, whether it's a business meeting in, you know, in a corporate boardroom, whether it is, you know, mother nature at her best or at her worst, whether it is human nature running into a burning building to save a dog, uh, risking your own life, you know, to do that. Or uh, there was just a, uh, this is just fresh in my mind. I was watching a, a video clip of a car that flipped off of a road, went into a river, sunk beneath the river. The driver was in there. One man saw that. He wasn't a strong man, wasn't a big man, didn't appear to be. He didn't even think twice. He didn't even think twice. There's something about us. He, he dove in and he broke the window and he's able to pull the woman out and save her. And there is a, a beauty. It brings tears to our eyes because we are good. In our essence, we've learned 
to be angry and hate. But there is a goodness that permeates human existence, and there's a beauty in that goodness. And when we see acts like that, it brings tears to our eyes, and you can feel the emotion well up in your body because beauty plays such a powerful role. It's just a role that we may not have been so aware of in the past as a society, certainly individuals, certainly artists mm -hmm. and you know, writers and musicians, but as a society, I think we're beginning to bring these principles uh, front and center so that we can come full circle as we build the new world that is emerging from the breakdown of all the things that are no longer working as we choose the values that we want to be at the foundation of that new world, I believe, and I'm, I'm seeing it happen, that our sense of beauty uh, is becoming more and more important in people's lives. And it is becoming uh, a part of that foundation and part of the, the values that we, that we cherish. I so agree. yeah, again, a long answer to a short question, but uh, well, I love your answer and I love your wisdom. When I decide, or like you say, choose to focus on the beauty in my life or the things that, that I truly appreciate, then it seems as if more synchronicity shows up. Like, um, I, you know, just what seems like magic, you know, almost like it. Um, and I'll go oftentimes, um, for a walk in the woods and I'll have the intention of, of just appreciating and something will show up that like, you know, like a deer crossing the path or a significant bird. And, and it will always have a message for me. Um, and, um, and I delight in those simple things. And I think that it's just, um, it should be everybody's priority. <laughs> um, yeah. I want well, to you know, Becky, uh, you you make a good point. And, you know, uh, we'll just be very honest. We, we're, living, uh, we're living a tough time on the planet right now. Everyone, mm -hmm. everyone is touched in some way by the difficulties. This is not just about a global pandemic. That, that has really brought a lot to a focus, but there's so much more that, that's happening. And I think one of the, the common themes that we are all experiencing, everyone has lost something. We are all, we've lost a way of life that we're mourning, whether we know it or not. We've lost freedoms, everyone has, for whatever reason, and whether it's right, wrong, good or bad, the fact is we are losing these things. We've lost loved ones. I lost my mom uh, to COVID just a couple of weeks before uh, Christmas. And I think it's in the presence of, of the loss and the suffering where we have a choice as to what role we allow beauty to play in the presence of our loss and our suffering. Because if we choose to be defined by the pain of the loss, then that sets us off onto a path of just that, of pain and suffering. If we can allow the loss to illuminate the beauty of what has been and bring a deeper appreciation of the freedoms that we have had or the lives of our loved ones, that beauty then informs us uh, and elevates us into new ways of thinking and looking in the, and for me, a deeper gratitude and a deeper appreciation for what is right now, but what's more important for what is possible and consciously setting the course to arrange our lives uh, to bring the beauty of what we know is possible into our lives today and, and for generations to come. So it's, I wanted to say this because so many people, when I, I talk about beauty, we, we've done this in workshops, beauty, people think of as going to an art gallery that you have to go, you know, or I, I live just outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. It's an artist community. And they think it's, uh, you know, about. What associated with um, glamour and, and um, yeah. you know, beautiful women. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So. So I, I think it, this, this is why I thanked you in the beginning for this summit. I think it's an important summit because you are bringing new possibilities of what a common experience that we all have, but what that experience can mean in our lives. And you're doing it in a time when everything is up for discussion. Everything is up for conversation. It's up for everybody. <clears throat> and everyone I'm talking to. 
Every, everyone I'm talking, I just had this conversation yesterday with a dear friend uh, who's in the media industry saying, what do I really want to do with my skills and talents in my life? Uh, you know, I'm okay with what I've done, but the world changed. What, I think what people are finding is that they, they want to do less of the fluff and whatever it is that their life is about, they want to get on with it. And to the degree that we can invite beauty to be a foundation and a guiding principle and a, a fundamental value that we cherish and give meaning to in our lives, we'll find that that beauty will serve us in the decisions that we make and the choices that we make. Plus, we're going to have more fun and it's going to be a cool world. So it sure is. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I have your book, The Wisdom Codes. <laughs> oh, I love that book. You know what? That book is coming out. Uh, it was one year ago. That book was released. And that means the paperback version is it's coming out soon. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, I downloaded it on my phone um, a few weeks ago. And, and I decided I want a hard copy. I'm still a book person. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> but um, what you were just talking about... Um, I wanted to, I wanted to read this part about grief. Um, you, mm -hmm. you say the, the only way to heal from loss is to feel what the absence of something or someone we love means in our lives. There's a direct relationship between the emotional trauma or grief of grief and the degree that we allow ourselves to feel our loss. The deeper the hurt, the more powerful the feelings, and the deeper we must reach inside ourselves to find the love that will enable us to transcend the hurt. Mm. It's through our grief that we discover a deeper and sometimes surprising capacity to love. I love that. And, um, you know, I, I love that too. I should, I should read my book. I have, not, I have not read that book since I lost my mom. And... Uh, I didn't know we were going to have this conversation, but I'm, I remember writing that part of the book and I remember where that came from. I was in Tibet having a conversation with a Tibetan monk <clears throat> about compassion and about love and life. And what the monk said to me, you know, we, we went halfway around the world, 26 days, 17,500 feet above sea level to an isolated monastery to, to meet with these monks and the nuns. There were nunneries there as well. And they were in awe that we would make the effort to come and find them. They said, you guys are the ones with the tough life, not us. And I said, you know, this is, I'm, I'm paraphrasing and this is through a translator. And I said, well, what do you mean? He says, it's easy for us. We live in the middle of nowhere. All of our meals are cooked for us. We don't have families, you know, kids, marriages, relationships. Our lives are dedicated to elevating uh, our, our spiritual existence. But he said, you, you live in a very different world. You have temptations. He said, you have husbands, wives, kids, partners, jobs. And he said, you have more to lose in your life as you're going through your life. And he was the one that helped me to understand he said, it's easy for us to love because, you know, he looked around, you know, what is there not to love? It's beautiful here. But as we go through life and we lose the things and the people and the experiences and the ways of life and the freedoms that we've come to cherish, the hurt for that thrusts us into these, the, the depths of these dark experiences. And the only way not just to survive, but to transcend, to become more than that hurt, is to reach deeper than the hurt, to find that capacity of love, to transcend the hurt. It's in the depth of the suffering that we have to reach and find that. And without that suffering, people typically never know what their capacity to love really is. So it was a very profound conversation that I had with him. Uh, and I went back the next year and we had a similar conversation again. We, we went back multiple times to the same, the same place. And, uh, and the more I thought about it, Becky, the more I realized, I think it's true for all of us. And this is part of the beauty. The beauty of our loss and our suffering is that if we have the wisdom to do so, we will allow our hurt and our suffering to reveal to us the capacity 
that we have to love. And in the presence of that capacity, we are changed. And we are changed in our relationships. We're changed in our communities and our societies and the way that we think and the way that we live. And that's, that is the power of the beauty to recognize it and the capacity to, to experience that love. Thank you for sharing.